What's going on, guys? Welcome to the Low Kick MMA Weekly Roundup. I'm your host, Ryan Galloway, and joining me is Jordan Ellis. We're here to recap UFC 260, the pay per view event headlined by the heavyweights. Jordan, before we get into specific fights, what did you think overall about the event? There was a lot of finishes on this one. Yeah, it was a good one, especially the main card. You know, I think people paying the, the 70 bucks or whatever it is won't be too disappointed because I'd, I'd say every fight on that main card delivered a. Um, I think just one was it just one went to the decision and that was a fun mm-hmm. fight with the two girls so yeah re- really fun card top to bottom and obviously you topped off with it with a brilliant main event it was great yeah it was looking worrying when the volkanovsky ortega fight fell out but hey no nah, it really did deliver so we'll jump straight into the main event i suppose and francis Ngannou claimed the heavyweight title something i didn't see him doing in this fight but you predicted correctly and he looked pretty exceptional doing it yeah and i think um, my pick was based on the fact that he'd look so good against really good opposition for since um, he'd last fought Miocic. Like, basically, no one's touched him since he's last fought for the title. Like, no one's come near him. And Kay Velasquez is one of the best wrestlers in heavyweight history. And as soon as he went for the takedown, he got he got sparked as well. So it's just... I, although it wasn't evidence, you couldn't see... You know, he weren't be, like getting the time to display all his new skills. I could kind of sense that he was improving despite that. And that's why I punted for him. And I, I was right in the end, it was... For me, it was one of the, the best title win performances you'll ever see. I'd put it along Connor against Eddie, um, Cody against Dominic Cruz. I think he looked fantastic. He showed everything. He had the wrestling. He was calm. He took a punch. Um, he had some great top pressure as well. He even went for his own takedown. And then he obviously got the knockout that we're all used to seeing. Him. But it was it was start to finish, all Francis. It was dominant. It was you know fantastic. And he's just a scary proposition moving forward. If this is what he looks like now, um, I, I, I really just wouldn't want to be Derek Lewis or John Jones or Stipe or whoever's going to step in with them because he looks, for me right now, unbeatable. I think he's going to have a nice little reign now as the, as the champ. And that's the thing, right? Uh, when I was thinking about this fight and trying to predict it, I hadn't seen these improvements in Garner's game because he just hadn't been in there. Four fights in under two minutes. You don't really see these, especially the grappling improvements. When he got shot on and was able to sprawl and reverse the position and get on top, I was like, all right, this is going to be trouble for Steve Bay here. I don't know what he's going to do. And I think after that, he never shot for a takedown again because he knew that it was, it was going to be dangerous for him. And I think going into this fight, it was probably his major game plan was... I'm going to out-wrestle this guy like I did in the first fight and just take him into the well where I'm more comfortable. But it just wasn't the case. So what do you do if you're Stipe? You're going into round number two. You can't take him down. You've got to stand with him. And standing with Ngannou is just a, a, a terrible place to be for anyone. And Ngannou's striking looked fantastic. He did get caught by Stipe. And Stipe did get a little overzealous and end up getting finished from that. But I still think had Stipe not got finished there, he would have either been outpointed or been finished later in the fight. You know, I thought Ngannou looked pretty incredible. Yeah, and and the thing about the takedown is not only did he sprawl and, you know, disengage, he got on top and was landing bombs. He reminded me of Brock Lesnar against Frank Mir, where he just had his head just absolutely battering him. And, you know, he made Stipe pay for that shot. And I'm sure anyone who was betting on Stipe when that happened, he might as well have crumpled up the bet because it, the fight was pretty much over at that point. Once you can't once you can't wrestle this guy and, um, you know, anyone who gets in with him, John Jones, anyone who tries to wrestle him, he's a 263-pound man. He, he's not going to be easy to take down. He's got a bit of, you know, he's got Kamaru Usman in his corner and um, he, he proved that. So he showed some, you know, great stuff. And yeah, it, it just, after that, it just seemed like a matter of time. And credit to Stipe because he had some shots that I'd mm. say every other heavyweight in the world wouldn't eat. You know, he was getting tagged um, early, often, hard. And he, and he had a few... But then in the end, it's, it's gonna you, you can't get hit by Francis Ngannou as much as he was, and, and it was done by round two. And if it weren't, if it weren't then, and if Stipe didn't lunge in, he would have got finished towards the end of the round or in round three anyway. So it was the right was on the wall, and it was just absolutely fantastic for Ngannou. It really was one of the best title winning performances I've ever seen, and it, I really look forward to the rain now. I, I don't know what you do with them, but I think whatever you do is, is going to be fun. And I will give praise to Stipe as well, especially early in that fight. He got 
bombed with hands and legs, and he just sat there and took it. And I think the punch that got him in the end was the, the counter right hook that he didn't see coming. Like I said before, that was the problem in the DC fight. The punch that got him wasn't the big shots DC was landing. It was the short right hook that he landed when Cipe didn't see it coming. He couldn't brace at all for it. Um, and with someone with Ngannou's power, it doesn't really matter, right? But yeah, Stipe looked good. I really hope he doesn't retire, but what do you do if you're Stipe? Because you've been champion for so long, so dominant. You did lose to DC, but outside of that, you haven't lost in years. Uh, you've beaten a lot of great fighters. Do you really want to be like in a Tyron Woodley situation where you're fighting these up-and-comers, you know? Or, or I guess I guess the heavyweight division is a little different because the a lot of the higher-up people in the division have been there for a long time, right? So it's not like you're going to get a murderous row of these up-and-coming prospects. But if you're Stipe, do you keep fighting? What do you think? It's tough, isn't it? Because um, the question is, like, before this fight, they were saying if he loses, he probably does deserve an immediate title shot again. Um, but the problem is, is Francis likes to fight it, like, quite often. He's mm-hmm. going to be fighting in June, July. Stipe's not going to be ready then. Stipe likes a long layoff. He, he'll go away and enjoy time with his family. I think he's got a young baby there as well now. So, And, he, and he's got another job to do as well. So... He, he's, he's not going to be back until the end of the year, I don't think. So we need someone in the meantime. I think Derek Lewis is probably going to be the guy. But for Stipe, what, why would you want to book that rematch? For, for me as a fan, the, the previous fight, you go, Francis, if he improves with wrestling, he could win that fight. Stipe, what does Stipe do to, to beat Francis at this point? He can't wrestle him. I don't see, how, is, is Stipe going to go away and, and improve his wrestling and, and be able to get him down next time? Is he going to be able to hang in terms of the boxing skills and things like that i'm not sure what he does you know i know it's quite soon after the fight but i'm not sure how he goes and wins a rematch so um i think i think there's still fights there if if, if john jones wants to like an introduction to the ufc heavyweight division without going straight for the title maybe stipe fights him but yeah but for me i, I wouldn't mind seeing stipe retire i think he's, he's done it all he's won it all um, he's got a, a beautiful family he's got a, a cool job he, he's going to be set for life i'm sure he's earned a lot of money so I wouldn't mind. It's all on him. I, I, I'm interested to see what he says in the coming days. And I'll just uh, put my two cents in here because I'm sure we're get, about to get to it. This fight needs to happen. Ngannou needs to fight Jones. You can't skip it. If they skip this now, I lose all faith in the UFC. And I, I saw Dana White at the press conference really uh, trying to play his hand against Jones, really, because Jones knows that they they want to make this MAGA fight. But Jones wants money for that for that fight, obviously. And Dana White's trying to trying to strong arm him into a lower lower payday or whatever. I think it's ridiculous. Just give the man what he wants. This is the biggest fight you can make. This fight is bigger than the trilogy between Poirier and McGregor. Hundred thousand percent. I don't think it's even competitive. This would be the biggest fight you can make right now, and they need to do it. Yeah, they do, but it's it's one of them things. As soon as I seen John Jones tweeting about money, I knew we weren't we're not getting this fight next. I didn't really allow myself to get excited of it because I just don't see it happening at least till the end of the year. I think we're gonna get Derek Lewis. I think Derek Lewis will, will answer the phone. It's an intriguing rematch, you know. I'm sure it can't be as bad as the last one. And um, we'll we'll get that fight. But in the meantime, in the background, Jones is gonna be negotiating his payday. And I think the longer he gets to work. Um, on his new body, on his new physique, and you know, be in the gym and with it, I think is better for Jones. So I think he will quite happily put this fight off for a little while while he's negotiating. So I, I, I'm with you. Just pay the man, but it's it's not going to go down like that. You just know it's never going to go down like that. John Jones and UFC are going to be in negotiations and disagreements for the next six months, in, in my opinion. And um, so I'm not getting too excited for, for that fight yet because there's. For me, from both sides, it's like John Jones is talking about money. Dana White's telling him to go down to 185. It, we don't seem like they're nowhere near each other. It's not like a, they're arguing over a few pennies. It's, you know, apparently that, um, John Jones wants $30 million. That's what Dana White mm. says. He wants Deontay Wilder money. That's what he was saying for this Angani fight a while back. And I think right now he gets about $5 million. So $5 million to $30 million, there's, there's a there's a way off. Um, so... They've got a lot of talking to do. Um, I hope they can sort it, but it won't be anytime soon. And as someone who was on the John Jones heavyweight champion 2021 train, uh, I'm really worried going to this fight if Jones does 
fighting Ganu because what do you do? How do you prepare for this guy who's just got in incredible power in his hands and hey seems to have really improved wrestling now? So and the biggest thing about his wrestling was his just size. Like as soon as he sprawled on Stipe, his hips were straight back because he's just so long and big. Didn't look like Stipe really had a chance to outmuscle him. So um, I guess Jones is bigger than Stipe, and Jones is a, a like a credentialed wrestler where Stipe's not. But yeah, dangerous fight for Jones, isn't it? Yeah, and and the the funny thing about that Stipe was when he sprawled on him, Stipe's whole body just collapsed to the floor. He couldn't hang with the power, and he's a heavyweight. He's the best heavyweight ever, and he couldn't hang with that wrestling power. So John Jones for me will won't have a chance in hell, and I don't think I think he'd be smart. I don't think he'd be smart to try and take Ngannou down, really, because I think that that would happen, and then John Jones wouldn't be able to get him off because he's not used to dealing with these big guys. He's used to dealing with 205-pound fighters, so to have a 265-pound man on your back, John, John Jones wouldn't get up, I don't think. Um, I think he, he can potentially... He's just got to be smart with striking, pick at him with kicks, get him coming in with elbows, and, and he could probably nail him that way if, if that's how Jones goes about it. But uh, interesting fight... We've been waiting for John Jones to step up for to heavyweight for years, like for literally the past decade. People have been seeking out it. So, uh, is it too late? Are we even going to get to see it? Are the UFC going to pay him the money? It, it's um, it's interesting. He seems to be doing the work, so it, it'd be a shame to see it all go to waste. And that was the thing uh, I, I thought about. John Jones really needs to be sparring with heavyweights. I haven't seen any footage of him sparring with actual heavyweights. If he can get in there with these huge wrestlers that are weighing 260 pounds or whatever, or these um, heavyweight boxers, anyone who can emulate someone of that size and mass that Ngannou has. Because at the end of the day, Ngannou's biggest asset, aside from his power, is just his sheer size and his muscle and his physique. Um, so he needs to be in there with bodies like that to get used to it. Uh, the other thing is... One thing that didn't really show in this fight for Ngannou was his gas tank, you know? He looked improved from that first fight by far, because in the first fight, he was gassed entirely. But to be honest, in that second round, he didn't look like he had the pop that he did at the start of the fight. He looked like he was starting to fatigue, not at the pace in the first fight. But if Jones can drag him into the fourth, fifth round, can he hold up? Maybe he can. I didn't think he'd hold up with the wrestling in this one, but he did. But we haven't seen that yet. Yeah, and the thing about um, this new Carl Francis is he kind of reminds me of Yoel Romero where he's that big, muscly guy and he's going to get tired, but it's all about conserving energy, taking the time off, then rallying with another big spirit, allowing yourself... So Yoel Romero does them five-round fights and he it's not at a frenetic pace or anything like that, but it's mm-hmm. it really stop stars And I think Francis could do that as well. And it, and it showed that in that fight that he did, he took his moments, he, he slowed the thing down, he was just hitting him with leg kicks every so often. It was it, it was understanding his body and the limitations of it and then working t- towards that. So for me, I think obviously he's going to get tired. Anyone would get tired in a five-round fight, but I think he could do it. I, I feel like he's got his head screwed on where he's not going all out for the finish. He's really picking his shots and, and yeah, he can do that over 25 minutes against Jones, I think. All right, well, going all out for the finish, we'll jump into the co-main event. Tyron Woodley come in, tried to put on a vintage Woodley performance, looked exceptional at the start. He got caught up in some cage wrestling, but aside from that, he come out and just threw bomb after bomb, almost put Luke down, managed to get caught with a counter and got put away and submitted himself. What did you think of Tyron's performance before we talk about Luke Because obviously he did exceptionally, but what did you think about Tyron? Yeah, it's his best performance in in for so long. You know, it's it was aggressive rather than uh, defensive. I think even when he beat Till, that he was back back to the cage and then caught him coming in. It went it went like he was going after Till. So for me to see him, you know, bite down his mouthpiece, show what he's about, I, I really liked it. I'm you know I'm not I'm not going to be sitting here and calling for his retirement right now because I think he still has got what it takes to to you know beat some guys. I think he beat a lot of the the welterweights in that division. He just he just came up against the guy who had probably the best chin at welterweight. Um, he took it all, responded, and, and looked fantastic. It was it was a really fun fight while it lasted. Both guys got fifty k, and um, yeah, there's not there's not a bad way to be said about Woodley. I don't think after that one. The thing is, like you look at the the fights, the last three where he just was hesitant and didn't really. He was just defensive. He fought defensive the whole fight, and this one he just fought offensive the whole fight. He needs to find the middle ground where he has these moments where he bursts into combinations, throws huge hands, but he also has that defense that he had in the other fights where he was going backwards because it was really a, a matter of Luke caught him. It wasn't like Luke was beating him up and landed a big shot. It was like he was over, overthrowing his right hooks and really 
putting his arms down and he got caught. And props to Luke for noticing that and making the adjustments after he just got hit in the side of the head by Tyron Woodley because I imagine that'd be a difficult situation to be in. And the dash stroke he ended up finishing with was pretty perfect. Locked it in straight away and yeah, got the tap. Yeah, the more I watched this, uh, like looked into the fight over the week, I did fancy Luke just because he's he's 29, he's coming into his prime. He's only lost the like the top top fighters, which I wouldn't say Tyrone is anymore. Uh, Tyrone, sorry, and um, and he's got the best chin. Like his chin is unbelievable. Like really, he got battered by Wonderboy for three rounds, and I, on that fight, I actually bet on Wonderboy to KO him. So I'm sitting there like saying, "Why won't this guy go, go down?" And he just wouldn't. He was wobbling all over the place, but he took it all. Um, and then I just thought, if Tyrone, if Tyrone can't knock him out, what what's going to happen? He had fought Luke Cage win, but just not that quickly. I thought it'd be over the three rounds, and it was super impressive because um, Woodley's, Woodley's a black belt as well, a, a legit black belt, and to tap him out with the Darcy is, is is very impressive. And Luke Cage goes on now. You know, I, I don't think he's going to be doing a Colby or a Gilbert Burns calling for a title shot off the back of this, but he'll get a big fight. You know, Leon Edwards is there. He wants a fight. Wonderboy wants a fight. Um, there's some big fights for him and I think he's going to be in the mix now yeah and I think uh, with that Dars choke I will mention that Tyron wasn't even there when he was on the ground getting no. grappled you know his legs were out from under him before that he fell to the ground uh, he couldn't defend that if he wanted to he was out of it um, but like you said he is a pretty credential grappler in his own right. So for Luke, that's a pretty good win there. Uh, I hope Luke gets a top five guy next. I hope he gets, um, I think Chesser might be five or six. Uh, there's a couple other guys. Edwards would be a good one, but I don't know about that because Edwards really does deserve that push to a title fight. Masvidal would be a fun one. I know he called out Diaz. I like the fight, but I don't think there's any way they go with that one. Uh, I, I did hear somewhere, maybe it was an Ariel's recap or something. He was talking about... Edwards potentially fighting Diaz, um, which I don't know about that either, but what do you think's next for Luke? Yeah, um, he's already lost to Edwards, he's already lost to Wonderboy, so mm. it's it is hard to make them them fights. But I think Kies is there, you know, Kies seems to be that guy who's he's in the mix, but he's not necessarily one or two fights away from the title shot. Style wise, it's not the most exciting to watch. Um, so I think you put Luke in there. Luke is never in a dull fight, so maybe you can drag kind of the dog out to Kieser and, and create some type of, uh, yeah, some type of brawl. So I think that would probably on paper make the most sense. But I don't, I don't hate the call out to Diaz. It's just, um, yeah, I don't think Diaz has ever taken that unless the I don't know unless they put on a, a co-main event of a, a pay per view. I'm not sure how they do it, but because it would be a fun fight stylistically. I, I think Diaz would be in trouble. I think um, Luke is much sharper these days in terms of the striking. So um, high risk, low reward, maybe. Don't see it happen. But I'm sure it's a big fight next, whatever, for Luke. Absolutely. And someone who probably will get a big fight next, not that they might deserve it, but Sean O'Malley back in the win column looked fantastic in this fight. He actually looked phenomenal. Uh, I think it was a bit of a mismatch in terms of the old guard and the new guard of MMA and the size. You could see in the octagon that Almeida just looked too small to get in on him. Um, and Sean O'Malley just schooled him for three rounds. I thought they should have stopped it when he got dropped in the first round on first watch. But after re-watching it, I thought, eh, you can let him fight. But in that third, it was pretty brutal when he got finished, wasn't it? Yeah, and it was it was a good performance, but it was a gimme fight in my opinion. And I think he was meant to win this fight. Uh, Almeida hasn't won since 2016. He was tough. He was durable. But that was it. He didn't offer anything else, really. Um, yeah, he was a punch your bag for three rounds. And, and and O'Malley looked great, though, in what he did. Everything he did was slick. It was um, clean. He, he had a good gas tank. He, he was really um, paying attention to them leg kicks. He was getting his leg out the way, doing a really good job of that. Um, and, and he's slick. He, no one's ever seen Sean O'Malley isn't, isn't a good fighter he's not slick it was a, it's more about when someone puts something back on him people want want to see how he responds and and this fight went the fight for that he dominated start to finish and he got a brutal finish so um, on to the next one hopefully the next opponent can put him under a bit more pressure and we see, see what he's got Look, I tell you, I think they're going to give him like a veteran, maybe a Cruz or not, probably not Faber. They'll give him someone who's on the on the decline that's a well-known name. Hope not 15 because he doesn't. He, he just beat Tom Salmati. You shouldn't get a ranked opponent after that. Um, but I imagine they'll give him someone that's been in there a while, which I really think they need to give him another prospect, someone that's about the stage in the career where he is maybe a Marab Valishvili. I don't know where he's ranked. He might not be ranked anymore. Uh 
There's other guys there that really make sense for an O'Malley fight. I just don't think the UFC are going to do that. I think they're going to give him another fight that's going to build him towards the ranked guys, which is fine. But the problem is once he gets there, it's it's like... A huge jumping competition, and for people looking at it to try and analyze the like, how do you know if he's ready for it? Because you look at the the Cheeto fight, yeah, he had that weird like kick on his nerve and his leg had foot drop, whatever. He lost that fight, and he got finished with like on the ground with TKO. I, I just think if if you go into a ranked opponent number fifteen, you lose like that. I actually think he was ranked in that, so I don't know. What do you think? I, I won't go on too long. I think the Dominic Cruz fight is probably the fight to make. It's not the fight I'd make because um, I, I, I want to see him built. I think he should be fighting, you know, David Grant or, or um, Yanaz or someone of that level. He's, he's for me, he's not, he's not, uh, he's not near the rankings. He's not, he's not that type of fighter yet. He hasn't beaten anyone to suggest that he should be in the rankings. Um, Almeida, good performance. Eddie Wyland, good performance. But they're not people who should propel you into the rankings, in my opinion. Uh, but that's what we're going to see. He's going to probably fight Dominic Cruz. I think um, that's a good fight for him stylistically. I don't, I, I, I'm clearly seeing signs of decline in Dominic now. I think Casey Kenny had a really tough trouble, like a tough night with him, and I don't think he would have a few years ago. Um, yeah, so I think that's the fight. I don't think he's going to be go, jumping up to Garbrandt level yet because I think I think Cody's kind of got his eyes on the title, and if he beats Rob Fonz, I think that's where he'll be going. So yeah, good. good. Uh, Dominic Cruz, I don't mind it because it's very winnable for O'Malley as well because O'Malley, um, Dominic is not a puncher. So if they do that over five rounds, maybe on a fight night main event or, or a co-main event on a pay-per-view, I think it'd be big numbers. Yeah, well, he's, if he's anything, it's entertaining, that's for sure. Like, when he fights, it's a spectacle. All his antics after the fight were quite hilarious as well. So I do enjoy watching Sean fight. I just don't know... If if uh, throw him into the mix with the top 15s right now after that win is is something you want to do. But hey, it will be interesting to see what they go with. Uh, before that, we had the women's flyweight fight between Jillian Robertson and Miranda Maverick. And I thought this was a pretty dominant performance by Maverick to get the win. But I will say, the two judges that had this at 30-27 are delusional. That second round was Robertson all day. Like I, I, I don't know how you could argue that Maverick won that second round. No, it's it, it was unfortunate. Because that takes the chance. I think the right person won. So um, the cards are really irrelevant in the end, as long as the right um, the per- right person gets it. I, I don't worry too much about the cards, but it's just a bit unfair on Robinson. And, you know, even if she'd won that third round, she probably wouldn't have won the fight because not, two judges didn't have a win in the, the, the round that she actually won. So it was, it was a good performance from Maverick. She looked good in the first round faced some adversity in the second and then she come back and, and turn the tables again. It was a really fun fight I've been looking forward to for a while. I think the two of the, uh, the best the you know, prospect in that division. Mm. Uh, for me, Robertson just needs to go away and work on a striking or because sometimes she looks a bit vulnerable when the fight's on the feet. It's almost like plan A or, or nothing. She's got to get the fight to the floor, dominate on the floor, or she's lost. And when she's up against defense, she looks very vulnerable to getting, you know, hit and hit and and things like that. So Maverick's just more of a complete fight. And she was really cool. I like the post-fight interview. I'm a fan now. I'm on I'm on the hype train. Um I like the fact that she's she's in she's doing a PhD and everything like that on the side. She's a teaching assistant. She's she's clearly very smart and, and she's just a bit different. She you know, she, she reminds me of a, a more tame version of Roxy. Roxy Modafferi, I think she's she's on that level, which she's a bit quirky, and and it's going to be fun to watch it over the next few years. Twenty three years old, and she's got it all in front of her. Yeah, and her grappling really impressed me, especially in that first round. Because I, going to this, I thought Robertson would have the advantage there, but she really didn't. Maverick was just bigger in the octagon. She she imposed her her strength in the grappling exchanges, and she dominated on the feet. So it was a pretty solid win for her. Any last thoughts on that fight before we jump on to the one before that? I wouldn't mind seeing Robertson go down to 115. I don't think she looks, when I look at her in the cage, I don't think she looks any bigger than, you know, a Rose, a Rose Namajunas or, or anyone like that. You know, even a Zhang, I would say, is bigger than Robertson. So if she can, you know, suck the weight down maybe a little bit more, could she make that? And she looks, she, it's not look, she doesn't look hungry in that cage. She looks, she look, and she looks fine. So um, maybe because she's been out muscled a couple of times in a row now where, where Maverick's just been able to get on top of her and, and dominate. And um, the Brazilian girl dominated the last time as well. So I forgot her name. But yeah, so may, maybe a change in weight, may, maybe a change in striking coach. Sutton's got a change in that Robinson counts, but she's, on, she's only 25 as well. So it's all ahead of her. 
yeah. Uh, opening up the main card, we had Jamie Malarkey from Australia taking on Karma Worthy. I picked Worthy going into this one, uh, which is not a good move when I'm picking against my own country, but hey, uh, I was wrong. Malarkey went out there and starts in 46 seconds and was a pretty brutal knockout. He looked great doing it as well. Yeah, it was, it was brilliant. And uh, that's two in a row now for Worthy, which is, which is a bit worrying. Mm. And um, on the media day, I think his talk was all about he's 35, he hasn't got long left in the game. It's now or never type thing, and and it looks like never. It, I don't know what he does. Maybe he walks away after this. Maybe he just accepts. You know, I'm never gonna be a top top fighter, but I can still make a load of money and and have some fun doing it. So, interesting to see what he does next. But um, yeah, love, lovely you knockout from Jamie Lachie, and he it was funny the way he fell like face first, then he finished. And it was it's a brilliant performance. Yeah, and uh, he's from a good camp, so I'm sure the UFC will be willing to push him after that win. I know he had a couple of setbacks before that, but they were both real close decisions. So, yeah, it's good for him to get that win. I'll throw it to you. Is there any prelims you want to grab before we wrap it up? Oh, sorry, I got news. Alonzo, Alonzo, um, Manifield, he he looked good. It was a last-minute performance, but um, last-minute opponent, sorry. He he looked really good, and um, it's good to see him back in the win column. Two two tough defeats, and it's... And for him, it's a nice touch to get a late notice replacement rather than William Knight because William Knight was a tough, tough fight. Mm-hmm. Um, Von Fluchok, I think that was just the fourth person to actually pull one of them off in the in the UFC. So, yeah, re- really, really good performance. And then other light heavyweights was um, but Bukowskis, one of our guys. I thought he was unlucky with the judges' decision, but it was a really fun fight um, over three rounds. The both guys gave in. It was more, I think, the judges just like like all of Chuck's aggression, but I, th- I don't think it was as impactful of what Modestus did. Um, besides that, you know, not, not a lot to touch on. I think it was really the, the main card. That's the to me. I really enjoyed the main card more than anything. It was brilliant, brilliant. And it was topped off by Francis becoming champion. It was, yeah, it, that was fantastic. Yeah, it was great. Now, we'll go to news now because I completely forgot we were going to do that. Um, but some news we had. One thing I forgot last time we did the, re- uh, the roundup, I-, I forgot to mention that uh, TJ Dillashaw is booked to return against Corey Sandhagen. So I guess we'll bring it up now. What do you think about that booking? Yeah, it's it's a, um, it's, it's a great fight. It's it's number one contender. Once Dana White said it's the number one contender fight, it has to be Corey because Corey's the number one contender. Um, and I do think it's good for Corey because... People were calling after the last fight that he should get the title shot, but there's there's only so like there's only a little distance between him getting choked out really quick by Sterling and being number one contender again. So I don't mind another fight. Um, T Day Dillashaw two years out off the juice. How is he gonna look? Um, yeah, interesting, good fight. Glad to see T J back. He saved his time, and you know, two years was a you know a fair sentence, and he and he's back now. Yeah, and I, I'm really excited for that one. I'm sure it'll be great. Uh, I have got other news here. Did you watch the press conference between Jake Paul and Ben Askren? I didn't watch it, but I've seen the, the clips, the bits, and um, all the main, main talking points, I think. And what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that... Because I, I thought Askren seemed a bit hesitant. Like, he's been so confident before, and then he comes in the press conference and says that we might find out Jake Paul's a good boxer. It's like, I don't know. It seems a bit hesitant to me, but what are your thoughts? I just think I think Askins having a laugh with it. I think it's not if for him it's not serious at all. When I spoke to him a few weeks ago, he's like, "This isn't even a fighter. He doesn't like. It's not the the start of his fight career again. It's just I'm fighting some kid who's not a fighter, and I'm I'm with Askin on this. Uh, Jake Paul's not not a fighter at all. He, he's he's not a good boxer. If he beats Ben Askin, he's still not a, a, a really good boxer. You know, um." It's so I'm with Ask and he's not taking it too seriously. We just released like a Rocky montage. He's that. having fun with it. And um, yeah, it, it was funny when he just pushed him in the face and then he'd come back with the, a little measly punch. But I think I, I think Jake Paul's learning that, you know, Askin's a bit of a troll and I don't think he, he knew that when he first, you know, signed on the dotted lines of facing him. But yeah, he's getting a bit of his own medicine right now. It's funny. Yeah, I agree with you there. Uh, is there any news you have before we wrap it up or will that do it? No, that'll do it. All right, cool. Uh, thanks for joining us, guys. And we don't have any fights next weekend. So, uh, but sorry, this yeah, next weekend. My bad. But we have a preview coming next week for the Till vs. Vittori card that will be the next one to air on April 11th, I believe, or 10th. I could be wrong. Um, but yes, yeah, so we'll speak to you then to uh, preview all that action. Thanks, guys.
Make sure to subscribe to the Low Kick MMA YouTube channel for all the latest news, event previews, and interviews with some of the biggest stars in MMA.